Welcome to Around the Empire, the show that takes you around the U.S. Empire. I'm your host, Dan Wright. And I'm your host, Joanne Leon. And on today's show, October 2nd, 2017, we speak with Pepe Escobar. Escobar is a correspondent with the Asia Times. We speak with him about the new axis of evil and discuss geopolitical and economic importance of the new Silk Road and newly developing alignments on trade and security in Eurasia. Pepe is the correspondent at large for the Asia Times and is a frequent contributor to websites, TV, and radio shows ranging from the U.S. to East Asia. Here is that interview. Tonight we're joined by Pepe Escobar from Bangkok. Welcome to Around the Empire, Pepe. It's great to meet you. Great pleasure to be with you, Joanne. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, Dan. <laughs> so we're looking for your big picture take on helping us figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> and the, um, two articles that you've written recently uh, really caught my eye. One of them was titled Unmasked Trump Doctrine Vows Carnage for a New Axis of Evil. And the other one is actually from back in January, Shadow Play, the new great game in Eurasia. And um, if we can kind of zero in on those two things, I know they're huge topics, Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk about this new Trump doctrine and the axis of evil. And what's your take on that? It's very complicated because this is not Trump's uh, doctrine. It's uh, more like Stephen Miller's doctrine. After all, he was the speechwriter for this uh, Axis of Evil remixed spectacular, I would say, delivered in front of the UN. And uh, later on, talking to diplomats, you you could tell that the reaction at the UN floor was uh, disbelief, I would say, between 80 and 90 percent. People didn't know what to make of it. Uh, Venezuela, come on. It's a joke. Uh, the U.S. government has been trying to <laughs> crush uh, Venezuela since Chavez in 2002. You remember that famous coup that didn't work in 2002. Obviously, everybody can make the connection because of Venezuela's uh, largest uh, unexplored oil reserves, because of the Monroe Doctrine that still more or less survives. It's our backyard in South America, etc., because it's close to the Amazon rainforest. You name it. There are so many Uh, reasons that Venezuela, uh, uh, in terms of U.S. uh, security strategy and expansion in uh, all across the Americas, is one of the keynotes. But uh, (laughs) on the same basket with North Korea and Iran, frankly, uh, it had an element of, uh, as I saw it, an element of Looney Tunes about it. Absurdity, yeah. Total absurdity. But uh, Iran is... uh, I would say that the crucial case here is Iran. Uh, I would say that the only, okay, the hyperpower, in fact, the only major power in the world that is antagonizing Iran at the moment is the U.S. All the Chinese big powers and middle powers are doing business with Iran, and some of them, even when sanctions were in place, especially China and South Korea, and to a certain extent, Japan. For China, Iran is uh, it's beyond strategic. It's uh, the key node for the Chinese of the new Silk Roads in Southwest Asia. The mm-hmm. connection between China, Western China, the Middle East, uh, Southwest Asia, uh, as we call it in the West, the Middle East. Not they they don't call it the Middle East, <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> and linking to uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. I was in Iran earlier this year. It's amazing. The Chinese are everywhere. And this does not pose a problem to to the Iranians at all. They said, we welcome investment. We know it can be a bit lopsided for the moment. But in the long run, the benefits for us are going to be immense, uh, including uh, investment in the Iranian energy industry. They need at least $200 billion to upgrade their energy industry. And that would include more uh, natural gas exports, which is something that not only the Chinese uh, want, but Europe wants as well. uh, When you talk about uh, 
Europe's uh, energy uh, security, which is a debate that has been going on in Brussels for almost 10 years. And this is something that I, ha I have been following <laughs> for the past 10 years, in fact. They still don't have a, a, a comprehensive energy policy because they always say the same thing. Look, we couldn't do business with Iran because the Americans will never let us. Now it's a completely different thing. If you talk to a, 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 an EU uh, energy commissioner, for instance, he's going to tell you, Okay, uh, we know that we are largely dependent on Gazprom, but we have a plan B that we cannot implement. We need gas either from Iran, from Qatar, or from Turkmenistan. So they tried the Turkmenistan. It's impossible to uh, negotiate with the Turkmen government, which is something out of the surrealist manifesto. You know, it's very <laughs> complicated. <laughs> uh, Qatar, it's complicated because uh, uh, we have to go back to one of the key uh, vectors of this whole drama, the Syrian war. One of the key reasons for the war in Syria was that famous pipeline clash, let's put it this way. There were two possible pipelines that could be built across Syria. One was the Qatar pipeline, which would go uh, through Saudi Arabia, through Syria, then to Turkey, and then the connection to uh, maritime connection with Europe. And that explains to a large extent why Saudi Arabia and Qatar wanted regime change in, in Syria in the first place. And the competitor was the Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline. Uh, there was a high-level meeting, uh, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. They had a memorandum of understanding. Uh, the cost feasibility, I would cost like $10 billion, and it was practically a goal. But then, of course, the, the war started to spread all over Syria, and this was put on hold. And now, after we have some sort of, a, let's say, I would say partial conclusion to what's going on in Syria at the Astana negotiations, which are ongoing, of course, uh, I would say in one or two years, we could have this pipeline back online, on, on track and eventually online. But, and that implies something that explains another piece of the of the drama which is the saudi arabian emirates blockade of qatar the main reason is because qatar finally start to talk to iran again closely and in terms of uh, energy security for both and their own interest if they build uh let's say a joint pipeline obviously uh, the chinese say said okay we could invest on it as well they could get at least some, some, of, some of the gas and some profits, of course. Uh, Ross Neft from, uh, from Russia said, okay, we want to invest this as well. But uh, they, have, they, they uh, share the largest uh, gas field on the planet, which uh, in the Iranian side is called uh, South Pars. The Qatari side is called North Dome. If they explore it together it's a joint in fact it is a joint exploration because it's the waters of the persian gulf right it makes perfect but sense you know it makes thing, perfect yeah. business sense for both and finally europe is gonna have its plan b okay it's gonna take it could take another six seven eight years but this is what europe would would have in the long run and that's exactly what they want in brussels so uh, when you have the americans interfering into this uh, business connection between Iran, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea on one side, and the Europeans uh, on the other side, including uh, major European firms, companies, multinationals, who are back in Iran, you know, big, big time. Uh, automobile constructors, you name it. Uh, obviously, if you talk that <laughs> we're planning on uh, renegotiating or even ditching the Iran deal, uh, it doesn't make any sense to anybody uh, uh, economically and on a, on a geopolitical sense. So then we have to analyze the reasons inside uh, the American political landscape. Why Iran? Of course, because the neocons in D.C. still yield an enormous amount of power and Iran is on their list. Uh, from uh, times immemorial, <laughs> neocon times immemorial, which is what? Maybe two decades, maybe three decades maximum. And then North Korea, of course, uh, in the, the new axis of evil. One, once again, the key problem in North Korea is the war is not over. So 
from the North Korean point of view, we are still in 1953. When you go to North Korea and you talk and you bother or you, you take the trouble to listen to what they tell you, which is something that very few, uh, practically no American media does or mm -hmm. hasn't been doing uh, for, for the past uh, five, six decades. They tell you, they all tell you the same thing, and it's a very rational position. Look, we are open to any sort of negotiations. And they just told Putin the same thing two weeks ago at the East Asian Summit in Vladivostok. Uh, at the, this was not reported in the U.S., by the way. You had in the same room the Kremlin, a South Korean delegation, and a North Korean delegation. They were talking, the three of them... You, you, you don't see this anywhere else. Not I, even I saw Beijing. most of it. I couldn't exactly. believe the South yeah. Korean president, too, was praising everybody. And I mean, absolutely. So, uh, the importance of this meeting is that not only they discussed possible, I would say, roadmaps ahead in terms of negotiation, and Lavrov is pursuing this big, big time. Lavrov was talking to the North Koreans, in fact, late last week. Again, you know, and they discussed a trilateral investment business mechanism, both Korea's and the Russian Far East, to integrate the Russian Far East with both Korea's via investment in North Korean uh, in North Korean ports. That was one le one leg of the uh, of the roadmap, and the other one, very important, which is something that the South Koreans uh, wanted for what, almost two decades now, a trans-Korean railway uniting South Korea, North Korea, and the Russian Far East, all the way to Vladivostok. Why this is so important? Because for the moment, uh, South Korea is cut off from the Eurasian landmass because of North Korea. And obviously, the South Korean chai balls, the big uh, firms as Samsung, LG, everybody else, they want to do business overland with... Uh, with Eurasia, especially the Russian Far East as well. So if you have a direct connection, it's perfect. And it's part of what the Chinese want as well. The, the Chinese New Silk Roads mixed with the Eurasian Economic Union. So it's a win, 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 win for everybody, including the North Koreans, because they're going to make more money and they're going to be integrated with the, the rest of Eurasia as well. So the, what always amazes me is that these are game-changing developments. They're very important, but you never read about them in American mainstream media. Never. Only, of course, in the independent websites, blogs in the U.S. They follow this uh, very closely, very well, in fact. But most uh, uh, American uh, uh, news consumers, they ignore it completely. So the only thing they are bombarded with every day is uh, the cartoonish uh, uh, rocket man against the dot art. You know, it's, it's completely <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, uh, when, you, when we are here in Asia, these things are floating all over. You know, the, the flow of information is very good. And now anything that happens in any part of Asia ricochets about uh, just about everywhere which is something that didn't happen, uh, okay, 10 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. Now it's a completely different matter. And everybody is very much aware, okay, the only solution uh, ahead is uh, more uh, Eurasian integration, which means uh, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, here where I am, uh, Southwest Asia, Iran, parts of the Middle East, Central Asia, the stands, uh, Western China, uh, Southern Russia, the Russian Far East, Siberia, the Arctic. It, it's, it's nonstop. And, ju and just to uh, try to follow what goes on on a daily basis, you go crazy. Because every day there's a major development. Like, you know, the Chinese are studying the feasibility of the Arctic route. Because they just found out that they can cut off uh, over one week in terms of uh, maritime transportation compared with the Suez Canal. This is huge. Well, because this means huge. that in a, in a few years, you're going to have a, a Chinese fleet going through the Arctic practically nonstop. You know, it's, it's just enormous, enormous. So uh, uh, when you compare all this uh, frenzy, uh, investment, uh, connectivity, uh, business, etc., all across Eurasia with this uh, isolationist uh, and uh, still very aggressive uh, 
uh, I call the Trump doctrine because for the moment there's nothing in terms of U.S. foreign policy. So uh, this was, uh, it, it may be a misnomer, of course, but it's also an, an attempt to uh, codify what the U.S. doesn't have at the moment, which is a coherent foreign policy. And this is something I discuss with my American friends all the time. And they all say, say, say the same thing. There is no foreign policy in D.C. Nobody knows what the, <laughs> the other arm is doing or if there are any arms doing anything, in fact, considering the, the, the State Department. Huh? You, you have people saying that, uh, OK, Tillerson should go. Well, he, uh, parts of the, uh, what, 30 or 40 percent of, of the State Department already is gone. Yeah. <laughs> and the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, okay, they're going to put what Nikki Haley as uh, U.S. Secretary of State. Then we're we're all that would be crazy. <laughs> that would be completely crazy, right? <laughs> but but what was Obama's? I mean, I I, I follow all that's good analysis. I'm just trying to think. Yes, Trump is isolationist. Yes, he's utterly offensive. Just naturally, that's not really his policy. It's just kind of he's offensive to people. Yeah, but. When I look at Obama's foreign policy, or we've tried to look at it multiple times, I kind of got the same impression. In fact, there was an editorial by the old editor of Foreign Policy magazine that I think it was titled Rice Pudding or something, which I still don't understand what that was referencing, which was like, you know, he just doesn't commit fully to bad bad things, but he doesn't actually have a vision or strategy. And there was all this talk about a, quote, pivot to Asia, but you never yeah. really understood what that meant other than, I guess, trying to thwart China's progress, but why is that necessarily a key U.S. objective, or why would that be good for the American, well, people versus maybe the oligarchic class in America? So I just, I just, I, I agree that Trump is incoherent and contradictory in so many ways, but I don't know if his foreign policy is that much different because I don't know what Obama's foreign policy grand design was. <laughs> Yeah, Dan, Dan, that's a very good question because uh, I would say the basic reason for the people to Asia was fear. Uh, I, I didn't bother to read Kurt Campbell's book about it. Kurt Campbell was the guy who came up with the concept of uh, the people to Asia inside the State Department. He sold it to Hillary. Hillary announced it, and then Obama announced it. So this was not an Obama idea at all. Obama doesn't know much about Asia. Sorry. He may know a little bit of Indonesia in the 60s, but he doesn't know about the complexities of uh, uh, especially China-Russia interactions, the interactions with South, Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, you name it, Central Asia. He was not exactly well-versed in all this. So he was sold this package by the State Department, especially by, by Kurt Campbell and his acolytes. Uh, it was immediately identified in Beijing for what it was, containment of China. Whatever the spin, Pentagon, State Department, you name it. And the Chinese started to, okay, we need a counterpunch. This was announced in 2011. The announcement, the official announcement of the new Silk Roads was 2013 in Jakarta and in uh, Astana, in Kazakhstan. So it's not that they had two years to come up with their uh, response. They already had it. Because the original idea for the New Silk Roads comes from the Ministry of Commerce in China. And the original idea was very simple. Look, we have uh, uh, overcapacity, overproduction. Let's try to export our overproduction to our neighbors. And then, obviously, when this went to the the master codifiers, uh, the guys who actually write policy in China. It's a very small circle. Now, a few think tanks, uh, people who work inside uh, the Zongana in Beijing. They, they, they okay, but this, this is our 21st century foreign policy. It's not that we are exporting the Chinese miracle everywhere. We want to do business with everybody, not only our neighbors, but our distant neighbors and our distant clients in Europe as well, in an integrated uh, manner with the connectivity to everybody and that famous uh, Chinese thing, which always applies. Win-win. Everybody wins. So uh, when they announced the new Silk Roads in 2013, this, uh, in terms of uh, the validity of uh, the people to Asia, it uh, immediately disappeared because uh, it was uh, combating uh, 
military strategy, essentially. What the pivot to Asia was essentially a military strategy. Don't forget that the, the first announcement, we're going to have an extra base in Northern Australia. <laughs> it was not a business thing from the beginning, right? And obviously, they, when they announced the New Silk Road 2013, starting from 2014, there was an avalanche of meetings, of pronouncements, of deals, of official visits to all these countries. And then we started to see the beginnings of a, really a master plan all across Eurasia. And this was discussed not only via the Chinese themselves, but inside the BRICS as well. Because the BRICS, the Chinese presented to the BRICS, so this is our master plan. You can all be involved as well uh, as part of the new development bank inside the BRICS. Uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is going to invest in infrastructure all over. So, and then this past uh, BRICS summit, for instance, they had the beginnings of what's going to be BRICS Plus. They invited uh, countries from outside the BRICS sphere. Uh, for instance, Thailand was there, Mexico, Tajikistan, you know, from all regions to expand the BRICS and expand investment, BRICS directed investment or BRICS organized investment in conjunction with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank as well. So when we look at the, the overall master plan, everything is connected and that's why it makes sense. And that's why it makes sense for the clients customers of China or business partners with China all over, including Africa, of course, which is part of the New Silk Roads, Eastern Africa. And the Europeans, if you talk to German industrialists, they love the idea of the New Silk Roads because one of the poles of the New Silk Roads in, in Europe uh, arrives in Duisburg, in the Ruhr Valley, which is an extremely just one of the most industrialized areas in Europe. And they are dying to do more business with the Chinese, obviously. Ports, Rotterdam, Hamburg, ex the, Chinese, the, the Italians are dying to do more business as well because Venice is part of the New Silk Roads as well. And uh, the Chinese are building a railway across the, from the Piraeus port in Greece, across the Balkans, all the way to Italy and then to Northern Europe as well. This is connected business, infra-European business, but business of the Europeans with the Chinese at the same time. So how could the pivot to Asia compare to all this? So the, you know, this notion of the pivot to Asia lasted, I would say, less than two years. It wasn't on headlines all the time, we remember. And then it disappeared completely. And when Trump came in, he killed the, I would say, the NATO uh, commercial arm of uh, the pivot to Asia, which was uh, the TPP which at the time in, uh, in Asia, uh, 2000, uh, yeah, two, three years ago, uh, the talk in China all the time was uh, TPP, uh, we, but we have our own Asian deal, which was being discussed and is still being discussed, the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Partnership, which includes Japan, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, etc., and the Asians among themselves are saying, oh, this makes much more sense if we have a, a trade pact among all of us than basically subscribing to an American devised pact that was basically written and redacted by U.S. multinationals. So, you know, this, the, the TPP started to be uh, mined, I would say, from the inside, especially by Japanese and Malaysians, for instance. So when you weigh all this in long term, it proves, one, that the pivot to Asia was a harebrained scheme, I would say, and its Chinese counterpunch was much more effective than anybody suspected, especially the Americans. Well, is is corporate, I mean, the, the this guy of the, I guess he's called the Eurasia Group, if I'm right, Ian Bremmer uh, wrote a book. Uh, it's called like the end of the free market, and it basically says that the U.S. vision. If there is anyone who's, I, I still can't get a straight answer of what the U.S. grand vision is, but is that there's this? It's a competition between state capitalism of the Chinese model and yeah. corporate corporate capitalism, which is the U.S. model, which gives sort of the anonymity to the corporate state to run. Basically, you know, big business calls the shots, and the politicians work for them. Versus a Chinese model where the state has actually a lot more direct role. 
And so I guess ideologically, that's what TPP was and expanding corporate, you know, the corporate tribunal system, which got a lot of play in the United States. So yeah. I guess that's a way of saying it's a it's sort of a Cold Warish system competition. But even that doesn't really, I think, fit because, you know, containment reminds me of the Soviet, you know, cannon strategy. But totally, China is yeah. one of yeah, China is one of US's main business partners. So I don't even know if this countries in Asia are interested in corporate capitalist model that we have here. So would it even play even No, if- they're not. And and they and their system, it's not only state capitalism. It's a mix of state capitalism with a huge Chinese private enterprise. It is a third way in terms of doing business. Uh, I remember years ago, we were discussing this uh, among a group of us, and uh, we came up with the concept of neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics, which is more or less what it is. You know, it's a mix of the state private uh, heavy state control, of course. Look, uh, you can invest in these areas, da, 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 but these ones are forbidden. And But apart from that, they leave private enterprise to do all sorts of deals all over the world as well. So, uh, And it is a, a third way. Just like their political system is the third way as well. We can agree or disagree with the pyramid political system in China. The point is that it works for China. So when we see American think tanks uh, saying, oh, the Chinese miracle is not exportable. Of course not. Uh, you, you cannot copycat what the Chinese do politically, economically. You can take some lessons from it. It's just what Deng Xiaoping took from the West. When Deng Xiaoping visited Singapore before the reforms in China in 78, it was excellent because his teacher was uh, Lee Kuan Yew the guy who built modern Singapore. New Lee Kuan Yew is an ultra-hardcore Western-style capitalist. And Deng Xiaoping got the best possible recipes from uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew and adapted this stuff to China, like when he created the special economic zones, especially in, in Shenzhen. Shenzhen was a mini Singapore, essentially. And that's why Shenzhen is, is a, it's a huge success nowadays, and even eclipsing Hong Kong in many aspects, and definitely already eclipsed Hong Kong in the most important vector, which is uh, technological innovation and their own Silicon Valley, in fact. Huawei, oh, yeah. Huawei, in fact, is one of the, I would say, uh, is now among the top three technological companies in the world. When you, when you compare them, <laughs> in fact, I, I do this all the time. I have an iPhone and a Huawei. When you compare the performance of both, the Huawei cell phones is infinitely better than any iPhone, including the new ones. So this proves to you that uh, you can have a technological leap in less than a generation. Well, one generation ago, Huawei was basically building a, a telecom infrastructure. They were not even in the cell phone market. So, you know, just, just a, a tiny example, Tencent in China, Alibaba, you name it. This is uh, their explosions the, the, the past 10 years. And, and why would you, if you were looking to adopt things, why would you look at U.S. model, which in 2008 utterly collapsed in on itself? Yeah. Why would that be appealing? I mean, I, th- I think like the, it seems like the ruling class in the U.S., or at least U.S. elites, have kind of just in their own minds forgotten about 2000 to 2010, that decade where they basically blew it on every level from mm-hmm. corporate crime to foreign policy to an economic meltdown. And they still think there's kind of this pre-America that exists. That the, but the funny thing is they may have blacked it out as a traumatic memory, but everybody else looks at it and sees it. So if you're a developing country, I'd much rather take my cues from China than I would from a country that's reeling from major systemic failures now in the grips of um, a kind of cartoonish demagogue president (laughs) (laughs) living in a country with incredible inequality and corruption. So I just think, I don't think America sells as well that that the elites think it does. I think that's kind of like a... It it doesn't, that they are too insular. And America, most American elites, they are very provincial and very insular. You know, even uh, compared to Europe, they don't understand how Europe works, for instance, not to mention Asia. The people who know how Asia works are uh, 
CEOs of uh, some big American firms that have headquarters here in Asia, know how Asia does business. They understand the concept of win-win. They understand the concept of not losing face. They understand the concept of uh, doing diplomacy Asian style with all those uh, rituals, politeness, gracefulness, not antagonizing your business partner. This is in, in America is a rat race, and it's it's really hardcore. It's a completely different system, especially compared to how you do business across Asia. And uh, okay, some corporate people in the US know how it's done, but mo- mo- most of the elites, in fact, they have no clue actually. And the only thing that they have to sell to the rest of the world is. Uh, Casino capitalism. Nobody wants casino capitalism. We all remember everywhere or happened in in 2008. And which is a crisis that is still rolling and rolling. And uh, it's uh, it's far from finished. On the contrary, it's metastasizing into a much deeper crisis in the long run. Yeah, we have a lot of weapons, too. (laughs) And lots of weapons. Exactly. And and weapons. (laughs) Right. The, uh, when you said that China counterpunched in 2013 with the uh, the announcement of the New Silk Road, do you think that at that point the Chinese and Russian alliance was uh, forming or bonding, or was it the war in, in Ukraine that pushed Russia, you know, back into into China's arms or really kind of solidified that alliance that may have been questionable before the a, Ukraine? It's a very good question, John, because it was a concourse of circumstances. It was, I would say, it was the perfect a positive storm from their point of view. Uh, the alliance was getting uh, stronger and stronger inside the BRICS. Since the early 2000s, and especially when Lula from Brazil was inside the BRICS, because Lula had a very good relationship with both the Russians and the Chinese. And he also acted, okay, we need to get stronger. And as a master negotiator that he always uh, was and is and remains, uh, in fact, one of the top BRICS uh, meetings was in Brasilia. And that solidified for good the Russian-China strategic relationship. Um. There was the other vector, which is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, very important, which is basically run by China and Russia with the other Central Asian stands, minus Turkmenistan, because as I told you, Turkmenistan is the surrealist manifesto. It's, it's is that the military different. alliance? Uh, no, 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 exactly. They started as a, basically a counterterrorism organization in the early 2000s. And then start evolving. I, I went to some of their meetings, and you could tell year by year how this thing was evolving into an economic cooperation uh, organism as well. And nowadays, it's much more focused on uh, trade, commerce, and connectivity than counterterrorism. Of course, counterterrorism for them, the number one preoccupation of all the members is what are we going to do with Al Qaeda and Daesh? Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is practically over. In fact, it is over. But we have Daesh uh, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, which is called ISIS Khorasan. That's the the Daesh branch. Oh, that's the new... I didn't hear that new name. Oh, yeah. You only read about this in foreign policy journals. (laughs) I knew of Al-Qaeda Khorasan. Of course, nobody knew. No, 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 exactly. But the ISIS Khorasan actually exists. These are fighters that were transported or self-transported from uh, Syria, Iraq to Afghanistan. Some of them are Arabs, but some of them are Uzbeks and uh, people from the Southern Caucasus as well. Because Daesh decided to open a new front in Afghanistan when they saw that the situation in Syria and Iraq was totally against them. So this is a major problem from the, for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. But it's a very small problem, and uh, uh, they think they can basically take care of it uh, via the Afghan government, of course, and with a lot of uh, uh, Chinese investment in the Afghan economy, Russian investment in mining as well. So they, they're 
basically when they get together to talk about Afghanistan, they say, well, look, we have our plan for Afghanistan. It's not what the Americans have been trying to do via a war that they will never win for 16 years now. Our plan is let's integrate Afghanistan into the whole uh, Eurasia connectivity thing. And, it, okay, it's going to take a while, but it's going to work. Example, a, a tiny example. Even India is part of this thing. And India now is a, a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They're financing a, a port in southern Iran called Chabahar, which is the port that is part of the so-called Indian Silk Road compared to Gwadar in Pakistan, which is part of the Chinese Silk Road. Right. So the Indians, in, in their, I would say, very, <laughs> in their small new Silk Road dreams, let's put it this way. Okay, let's build our own mini Silk Road uh, for our uh, Navy and our exports going to Chabahar in Iran. Uh, Iran and India, they get along very well together, diplomatically and economically. And we make an extension to Afghanistan. So then we can trade to Afghanistan, bypassing Pakistan, going through the Indian Ocean. So this, and once again, this is happening inside the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as well. So they have some have conflicting interests. But once again, the overarching interest of all these actors is more business, more trade, which in the end spells out less attrition, like between India and Pakistan, especially. Uh, like Iran and Pakistan years ago, they were at loggerheads. It disappeared completely because they see that the potential of doing business and also the possibility of another pipeline from Iran to Pakistan, the famous IP pipeline, which is still not finished after, what, 10 years or so, but it will be finished, and it's an umbilical cord between Iran and Pakistan. It's very important. This prevents wars, essentially, right? So uh, inside the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, all these uh, trade investment connectivity projects are being discussed much more than how to fight terrorism because they think they can do it their own way, not without a war. And their own way, crucially, does not include uh, a Trump-style, in fact, a McMaster-style uh, surge in Afghanistan. 4,000 extra troops are not going to do anything in Afghanistan. Look, I've, I've been there many times. I covered the war before, during, and after. I traveled during Taliban Afghanistan. The only way is to incorporate the Taliban in a national dialogue. As nasty as it can be, and it is, but there's no other way. They control 40 or 50 percent of the country. They have to sit on the table with the Taliban. OK, so it's the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, the Pashtuns, the Hazaras, everybody in the same table. OK, so what are we going to do? Uh, are we going to live with a centralized government? Or are we going to have a lot of autonomy? And each of us in our provinces, we decide our future. And this is something that only the Africans can decide. But you, you can have some people around to, you know, let's say more or less organize the debate. And that's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which, very important, Afghanistan is an observer and soon going to be a full member as well. But does the U.S. want peace in Afghanistan? See, this is no. the issue. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, I'm, you, you, I'm asking your question right away. <laughs> Colonel Wilkerson said, you know, Lawrence Wilkerson on The Real News yeah. said that he thinks the escalation or whatever you want to call it, no, the mini surge is about messing with the the new Silk Road. Yes, of course it is. And uh, look, Colonel Wilson, uh, he's always uh, spot on, always. And this, I think, this is one of the best uh, observations he made in the in the past few years. And you will never read that anywhere in American media, anywhere, anywhere. And of course it is. They need some sort of uh, force in this crucial intersection between Central Asia and South Asia, because it's very well located to disturb, harass, thwart, interfere with any Silk Road project passing through or around this intersection. That, it, that's absolutely no question for it. And Russia and China, they see it very well. So now they have to find out a mechanism to, okay, how are we going to proceed 
with trying to find peace with Afghanistan, but at the same time trying to contain the Americans because we know they're going to, you know, raise hell sooner or later, or they're going to start finances uh, ISIS Khorasan. This is something that is actively discussed in uh, Russia and China. American financing of uh, extreme right-wing jihadi uh, organizations. This is, this is not a taboo uh, in Russia or in China, and they actually persuaded that that's the case. Uh, what we can say, for instance, in Syria and Iraq is that uh, the U.S. at least let it fester, which is something that Michael Flynn himself admitted on the record, because this was the best way for Assad must go. So if we have an extreme right-wing jihadi, completely nuts uh, organization, they can destabilize Syria and we profit from it because the Assad government is going to collapse and then we're going to have our, our own proxy. Obviously, as we all know, it went terribly wrong when Russia decided to get into the, the fray, right? right? And that memo that Mike Flynn put on the record as head of DIA is what is yes. was, was what got John Brennan and and furious former CIA director John Brennan furious at him and um yeah. I would I would bet all the money I have if I had one place to place that bet I'd bet on John Brennan as the leak of that intercepted communications between him and the Russian ambassador but uh <laughs> motive means that's an a, opportunity that's a very good bet then it's it's a very good bet I think it's the that was payback bet. for that memo <laughs> <laughs> So this seems like a good time to segue to your theories on the new great game in Eurasia. Great game, I think, referring to the big new Brzezinski and uh, Grand Chessboard, great game. You know, the fact that I guess that would be Central Asia is such a controlling that territory is the key to, you know, maintaining some kind of control over the world. Now, that was certainly a dominant theory in American foreign policy, mm. though Brzezinski himself sort of backtracked on that shortly before he died. And the great game in Eurasia, like, the way things are being portrayed right now is that, is that Russia and China, or, well, we let's just say Russia, because we're not talking a whole lot about China here mm. now. We're, everything's Russia, 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 as you know. Yeah. Uh, they want to take over the world. They want to change the world order. They want to ruin the, what do they call it, Dan? The the liberal, the great liberal order. What are all this stuff? They're that trying they're to saying? destroy NATO and Europe and their, and their are precious, well-functioning liberal democracies. Putin invented racism. I mean, they're being blamed for it, everything, everything, right? <laughs> In America, they're being blamed for Black Lives Matter. They're being blamed for... They'll be they'll be blamed for the Las Vegas shooting, yeah. Huh? Yep, that's yeah, that's all. That's I around. I think the that's corner. already yeah. That's common. But but you suggest that the great game strategy or the the desires of China and Asian powers is basically for more. Well, you mentioned that Putin and Xi Jinping dream of reenacting a balance of power similar to that of the Concert of Europe, which lasted from eighteen fifteen. After Napoleon's defeat, one hundred years, exactly. won. and he said that's when Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia decided that no European nation should be able to emulate the hegemony of France under Napoleon. So they're really not looking to dominate, to you know, to rule the world themselves. They're looking for more balance in the among the powers. Absolutely, is that yes. It is, uh, Joanne, look, it, it is, and this is not wishful thinking. This is not ideological. This is uh, basically a reportage and a, a pragmatic view of what they have been doing all this time. So if, if you follow closely what Russia and China have been doing economically, politically, geopolitically, etc., uh, this is a, a, it's an evident conclusion. And if you get deeper, it's even more evident. And Putting uh, Lavrov, uh, the team around that, the, for, the Russian foreign ministry, they keep saying this all the time. The only thing we want is a more level playing field to be respected as one of the great powers, as we are. And we want to do business with everybody. So backtracking a little bit, Putin actually proposed the original Silk Road, 
in Munich 10 years ago in a famous speech that was obviously derided uh, uh, in the Beltway as uh, Putin's uh, attempt at dominating Europe. This is completely ridiculous. Even the Germans at the time, they uh, admitted that this was a very good idea because for German industrialists doing business with Russia, it's, it's beyond excellent. It's a huge market. They get energy and they can export German know-how. It's perfect. It's a win-win uh, combination. Uh, and obviously, because of NATO, especially, and because of American pressure, this came to nothing. So, uh, spurned by Europe, when I say Europe, I mean Brussels, and when I say Brussels, I mean the NATO controlling the European Union, which is what it is. If you go to Brussels and you work in Brussels a little bit, this is what you see. There is this veneer of independent Europe, the EU institutions, but who controls their foreign policy? NATO. So basically, they are an American satellite, period. We can get into details, of course, but this is the big picture inside Brussels. So obviously, when you have an order uh, straight from uh, DC uh, to Brussels that, look, forget about Russia, they have to fulfill it, right? With China, it's much more complicated because China is, uh, you, <laughs> you cannot dictate anything to China because they have been dictating economically the way the world is going since there are three decades of growing at over 10 percent a year you cannot argue with that not to mention uh, their economic power uh, their financial power all those reserves they have in us dollars the fact that the, the, the american chinese business partnership uh, trade uh, imbalance as the trump people like to to call it but that that's it and you cannot escape it and people in asia uh, like here in Southeast Asia, they're more or less, uh, okay, let's cope with it. We may not like it, but uh, they are our number one trade partner for, for all countries uh, in this region, in fact. Uh, they are investing in our economies, which is a good thing. So we have at least to compose with them and have win-win uh, situations and projects. With American foreign policy, there's never a win-win situation. We, we know this very well. For the elites in D.C., it's still uh, the first few years after 1945, where they controlled 50% of the globe's output. This is gone, going, 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 gone, in fact. And you have to adapt to it. And this implies a multipolar world, like I described in that article, something that lasted for 100 years, and it worked in Europe. And it could work again nowadays because we have a series of powers which more, they are more or less equivalent in terms of a geopolitical reach, economic might, etc. America, North America, for instance, US and Canada, Western Europe, the EU, uh, and, and Russia, China as a partnership. These are, I would say, three major blocks and they can compose. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's in, in geopolitically, it's possible. If you are with a win, if you have a win-win mentality, and if you have a mentality of, uh, okay, let's do business among themselves and forget about wars. But then we have all the negative factors that have to be included. The power of the industrial military complex in the US, uh, the fact that NATO is controlled by the Pentagon, essentially, uh, the neocons, which are still very powerful all across the Beltway. And obviously we have, uh, on the other side, of course, we have some very hardcore ultra-nationalists in China that they don't want to, to have, uh, let's say, a sharing relationship. They are actually thinking in terms of uh, by 2030, between 2030 and 2040, China is going to be the number one power in the world, and we are going to rule like we ruled for 18 centuries. We cannot forget that this uh, is very also uh, uh, impo an important vector in Chinese politics. But what we have in terms of, uh, for instance, Putin and Xi, the leadership in the Kremlin and the leadership in the uh, Politburo, which is going to be reaffirmed in two weeks from now in the Chinese um, Party Congress, is connectivity, win-win relationship, and multipolar world. And they have the mechanisms and the institutions to make it happen. And now we're talking about the New Silk Roads, Eurasia Economic Union, the BRICS uh, Development Bank, 
the Asian Infrastructure Inf Development Bank, all, uh, the Silk Road Fund, you name it, all these mechanisms. The non-aligned movement, which uh, China is very much respected, India is a member, Russia is very much respected as well. So this gives them a uh, global breath as well. Good relationships with Africa. Russia now emerging as uh, the new big power in the Middle East. And everybody in the Middle East wants to do business with Russia. Not only business, uh, direct business, but uh, profit from Russia, geopolitical expertise, in fact. And the fact that they practically solved the Syrian problems with the minimum strike force, which is amazing, isn't it? So all this points towards a multilateral world. And it's, once again, it's, Everything that the oligarchic American elites don't want, and they are not prepared to accept. And then we have to go back to the rise and fall of global empires. We have to reread Paul Kennedy. It's all there. I was going to say, it's go ironic ahead. that you're, you're talking about a concert of Europe because one of the few people who I've seen, I don't want to say moderating influence, I dare not say that about Henry Kissinger, whose, I guess, doctoral thesis or first major work was about Metternich, and it Absolutely. called the world restored. And yeah. he's been actually one of the few people who seems to not be out for blood with Russia. True. And that was true even, and he had a more, I would say, measured response to Ukraine, what happened in Ukraine, and kind of, and, and as Joanne said, Brzezinski kind of dialed it back from his grand chessboard rhetoric. And it seems like those people are actually kind of being labeled uh, appeasers. They're not, yeah, yeah appeasers. Yeah. They're they're not ready. These guys, these you know, real politique people, they're not ready to to engage in what I think is being geared up for by the neocons as some sort of cosmic moral Straussian struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. between Russia and the United States, and suddenly even the real politique people who can be very ruthless, which Henry Kissinger certainly can be are kind of yeah. being put to the side for the bloodthirsty neocons who somehow have influence, even though Trump ran us specifically against them. So it's, it's interesting that it, the concert of Europe is a model because that's what Kissinger wrote his big thesis about. Abs absolutely. And this is, uh, you remember that uh, he was having uh, a lot of conversations with Trump uh, between December and early January. He was going to Trump Tower practically every time. All, all the time, sorry. And, uh, and I'm sure he imprinted on Trump, look, this is a, you cannot pick a fight with Russia and China at the same time. You would if, you want, <laughs> as a, if you want to pick a fight, Russia, there's, there, why pick a fight with Russia? They are our partners. and They want a, a stable world. And they're, and they are not a threat to U.S. national security. This is essentially what 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 what, what he told Trump. China is different because of uh, their economic power. But don't launch a trade war against China because you're going to lose, and the U.S. may lose even more than China. What you could do is play one against another. This what this was Kissinger's uh, recipe. Let's put it this way. The thing is, if you want to do this, you need to have a guy like Kissinger. As your Secretary of State, for instance, and it's not going to be ExxonMobil T-Rex that is going to pull that off. You know, ExxonMobil T-Rex, he wants to do good business with Russia because, after all, he was doing good <laughs> business with Russia yeah. with ExxonMobil, right? <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not sure he knows a lot about, uh, about what goes on inside China. You know? and, the prob and the people who surround Trump, they are all China hawks. Oh, yeah. Peter Navarro. I mean, that guy Peter is... Peter Navarro. His book on China is a joke. Okay, I, I gave up after page 20. Okay, I admit. <laughs> it's a joke. But it's, it's a joke. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, to, to answer your question a, a, a little further, and Brzezinski at the end of his life, it's like he was recognizing that he was complete... Not only he was completely mistaken, but everything that he was preaching you know, disappear into Saharan dust, in fact. <laughs> he, he spent his whole life saying, what the U.S. needs to do is to prevent the emergency of a peer competitor in Eurasia. Not only there was the emergence of a peer competitor, but a peer competitor alliance. <laughs> yeah. so, so can you imagine how he felt before he died? You know. 
So he had to be a little more realistic. But uh, if I remember correctly, one of his last uh, op-eds, he was saying essentially that uh, we need to bring Russia back into the Western fold, which is something that you will never hear from Brzezinski. Ever. You think he said one or the other, you know, he, yeah. that triangular thing. He said exactly. you have to side with one that, against uh, the other. Because he, he was actually saying that Russia is the, uh, in terms of the short-term threat, uh, the big problem was Russia. But the long-term threat is China. Right. So he had to find a way to compose with the situation. So, okay, so let's try to bring, let's try to seduce Russia with something. And then we deal with China in the long run. So uh, in the end, more or less, uh, Kissinger and Brzezinski, which are very far apart in terms of foreign policy, they are more or less converging. We have to deal with them uh, and we have to, tr to try once again some sort of divide and rule uh, mechanism. But they, they still didn't know how. They didn't have a roadmap. And nobody in uh, U.S. foreign policy has a roadmap because... First of all, nowadays, as we stand, you cannot play them against each other because they have a concerted strategy that is not only political and economic, but geopolitical as well. And this, uh, I would say, it's practically an obsession for, for Xi and, uh, and Putin. A multi they are striving towards a multipolar world, and the Americans will have to accept it because this is, these are facts on the ground, in fact. And divide and rule is not going to work anymore. So, so what are you going to do? Launch a war that you cannot win. If you launch a war against Russia, we all die. Everybody knows that. Well, if I you think you just, you just hit, you hit the key point right there is that there are a bunch of people who still think we can. Still think it's we can win. Joanne, Dan, it's a, if, absolutely. If, if you read, uh, if, if you look at uh, official do Russian documents, obviously the Russian Minister of Defense, they'll never, they'll never tell you <laughs> what kind of hand do they have. They're very good poker players, apart from being chess players. In terms of a more modernization of their uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and their uh, what uh, De Gaulle used to call force de frappe, you know, uh, uh, their capacity to strike the enemy, the Pentagon knows some of it, and they are terrified. Because now it's more than clear that if there is a war, first of all, the U.S. is not going to win. And second, we will all die because this is going to be a major nuclear war. And with China, it's, the, it's absolutely the same thing. Not to mention that if you try a lateral war, like uh, Afghanistan was a proxy war. Syria was a proxy war. If you try a war in North Korea, it's not going to be a proxy war. No, the you go already, yeah, yeah, you... The Chinese already said on the record. If there is an unprovoked attack on North Korea, we side with North Korea and we're going to defend North Korea. First of all, because they have a written strategic pact dating from the early 60s and renewed every 10 years. And the Russians, they didn't say it out loud, but uh, they let it know through the appropriate channels that, uh, look, we're going to intervene to maintain stability in the Korean Peninsula, which is a, a very Lavrovian way of saying, <laughs> don't try anything funny. You know, it's funny, Steve Bannon, who was pushed out or, well, he said he left because it was his one year anniversary, whatever. One of the interviews he gave to the American Prospect, which is just such a weird venue for this, but he basically said, you know, the North Korean option is ridiculous. There's no scenario in which... Seoul, True. a city of Absolutely. millions, isn't destroyed because North Korea doesn't just have this nuclear weapon burgeoning. They have the, one of the largest artillery arrangements. Artillery, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. Seoul is actually within the line of fire of the just conventional artillery. And there's no scenario that Bannon said this where Seoul isn't just leveled, and that's a city of over 10 million people. So we can't do this. And that, and that Bill Crystal had a you know, conniption over this and completely lost it and said, this guy's got to go. I mean, he just admitted, he just took Trump's legs out. I'm like, do you think people don't know this? you think people don't know that Seoul is over if a war breaks out? But this proves to you how uh, remote from the reality these neocons are. First of all, they've never been to any of both Koreas. No? I'm sure many of them have never been to Seoul itself. And if you drive from Seoul to the border, you see that it's literally 
you know, it's it's half an hour, it's forty minutes from the border. It's it's completely ab absurd. But and this does not prevent uh, all these, uh, I would say, clowns to pontificate on an everyday basis or twenty four hour, twenty four seven on cable all the time, saying, "Ah, we need to attack North Korea." Now war is in that. You you read <laughs> headlines every day. My inbox is full of. I have a daily intake of headlines. War with North Korea is inevitable. <laughs> Come on. I'll just hope no, none of them are crazy enough to actually do it. I'm still not completely confident of that, that they they are, because uh, I just think what? that they think that they can reset things back to the way they were after World War II. Everybody else is, is wrecked, and we're still in good shape, and that's how... That's how you save the empire. I mean, this whole thing seems to be the groupings and the everything dialing up. I mean, it seems to be a build up to world war. <laughs> of course, it depends on the decisions that people make. So I guess we, we've kept you for a while, but I, I did want to ask you, this does look like an escalation toward a world war. You know, the the different sides massing and what's the... What's the best outcome of something like this, do you think? The best outcome would be diplomacy. But this is something that, uh, from the point of view of an hyperpower, you are above, uh, you are not even a, a primus inter pares, as we used to say in Latin, but uh, you are way above, you are like a Jupiterian entity. And everyone around you, uh, they are lesser gods. And uh, you are the dominant power. And you have the thunderbolt. And nobody else has a thunderbolt. Take that, yes. Macron. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Take that, Macron. You bet. <laughs> well, I was forced to follow this uh, asshole because uh, <laughs> Paris is one of my homes. So I could not escape it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's revealing his true colors now to the French uh, voters, in fact. And people in France are absolutely appalled. Uh, and most people didn't know that they were, they were electing me, uh, essentially a Rothschild banker that was going to really, really raise hell with their pensions, their benefits. And now they're starting to wake up. It's a bit too late. Anyway. But, uh, you know, answer your question, Joanne. Uh, diplomacy. And diplomacy obviously means... Uh, uh, we're going to have the U.S., the EU, Russia, and China sitting at the same table in a sort of new Versailles, Yalta, Sochi, you name it, something. You know, Reykjavik would be fine. Reykjavik is, uh, is wonderful for this kind, these kinds of meetings. And, okay, let's uh, devise more or less the division of powers in the 21st century. Uh, in a mutually acceptable environment, a geopolitical environment. Obviously, but this is, it's, it's wishful thinking. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Uh, the Europeans will be up for it. Russia and China, obviously, this is what they're aiming at. But, uh, you know, the American establishment would never, they will have to recognize that uh, those uh, few decades of unlimited power are over. And if we, if we look at what happened historically, it's never worked like this, right? Uh, so this, uh, this blah, 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 once again, of the Thucydides trap. Well, I actually, once again, I took the trouble of reading that book. It's bullshit, in fact. In fact, if, if you read the Italian historians on Thucydides, then you get the real picture. But first of all, you need to know these guys, and you have to read it in Italian, which our friends <laughs> in D.C. will never do it, right? <laughs> I don't think so. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, an appropriate analogy because the Chinese, basically, they, they, they don't want uh, a unilateral world domination like we had after the end of World War II. Their frame of mind is business-minded. They want to do business with everybody, even uh, uh, the Nanooks or, or people in the Arctic, as long as everybody gets a piece of the action. So this is based on trade, commerce, and connectivity. It's a completely different story. And it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't imply having a Chinese Pentagon say, uh, with 800 Chinese military bases all over the world. They have one small base in Djibouti now, which is not a big thing. But it's basically to protect their tankers. 
in the in the oceans uh, in, in the waters nearby the Suez, it, yeah. it's very very simple you know it's not a question of uh, it's not like camp bond steel in kosovo or uh, american bases all across iraq after the invasion in 2003 it's a completely different story but even that little base set off a complete meltdown in the West. Complete Christ. meltdown, oh my Lord. exactly. Good. Yeah. China's yeah. in Africa. China's in Djibouti. China's <laughs> in They're going to take the continent. And, you know, <laughs> which, of course, was partly real, genuine psychological instability and partly people in AFRICOM saying, great, now we finally have a, a decent, you know, geopolitical pretext for our exactly. endless expansion. <laughs> We have to be here. China's here. Exactly. Build big China's bases. Here. Yeah. And don't forget that before they, they, they had this base in Djibouti, they have been doing business with 50 African countries for over two decades. So the Chinese are already everywhere in Africa. The base is just a detail. Yeah. Anything else you want to throw out there before we wrap up? Too? Well, uh, I... Uh, maybe we should try to end with a, a positive note. No, I, I don't see any positives anywhere, to tell you the truth. Uh, and, and my line of work is to deal with hell after hell after hell. You know, like a, before talking to you guys, I was uh, six feet under the Catalonian question. Oh, jeez. Which yeah. is another insoluble European drama, you know. And it, it's going to get much worse from... Well, after what happened uh, this past Sunday in Catalonia, you know, so it's hell after hell after hell. Uh, but uh, okay, t- okay. Let the positive note: if we could have a, a new concert of uh, big powers sitting at the same table in Reykjavik to discuss uh, how we're going to prevent war in, t- in the 21st century, the, I, I'm sure this is the only uh, way out. Otherwise, we're going to have this proliferation of mini hells everywhere ukraine uh, syria and iraq stuff that people doesn't even they don't even talk about uh, anymore congo the rape of congo which is ongoing yeah uh, exactly uh, me, the, the problem in myanmar which is serious but not as serious for instance as the humanitarian crisis in yemen which involves 15 million people not 500,000 like in myanmar so it's it's just to keep up with this accumulation of mini houses, uh, it's it's terrible. And of course, they all fit a pattern that includes, uh, of course, regional uh, clashes, but also proxy clashes. And these proxy clashes, one of them sooner or later is going to get out of control completely, and then we're going to have what we fear the most, which is a direct clash essentially between the, I would say, between the U.S. and Russia, much more than the U.S. and China. The U.S. and China would be North Korea, but everywhere else is the U.S. against Russia. Right. So, sorry to say that, guys, but uh, this is what <laughs> re- reality is all about. <laughs> well, we'll keep, we'll keep reading you as, as hell after hell. We look forward to more hell, uh, Asia Times, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll read you there and see you online. Very Where much. can people find your work, Pepe? Yes, uh, that's a very always com- very complicated question. Until a few <laughs> months ago, I was writing op ads for virtually everybody, but now I am back with Asia Times, which was my journalistic home for what fifteen years or so, and uh, they want me to be exclusive for them, which it, it poses a little bit of a problem because. Uh, my op ads for everybody else for the moment they are on hold. Uh, I mm-hmm. hope they will come back eventually, sooner rather than later. But for the moment, my stuff is on Asia Times. In the US, a lot of people republish uh, my pieces, right. including Counter Counterpunch in California. They do, they they do this on a regular basis. Information Clearing House. Uh, my friend the Saker, who lives in Central Florida. His, we- his website republishes my stuff as well. So it's easy to find it. And Zero Hedge sometimes. And zero, uh, zero Hedge, Zero Hedge, they're linking with a lot of uh, my pieces as well. So it's easy to find them. All right. Well, it was great talking to you and uh, finally meeting my you. My pleasure, this, guys. This is great. Really and let's enjoyed talk it. again sometime. Yes, whenever you want. Uh, I will, I'll wake up early because of <laughs> <laughs> I was just glad you couldn't hear this owl that's hooting outside my window. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, it's going to. 
do this all through yeah, the, it's, the interview. It's because I usually go to bed very late here because I follow Asia, but I follow the US as well. Oh. So I go to bed very late, like 4 a.m. every day. You know, oh, so no. My I mornings don't... are usually you know, <laughs> are very minimalistic. <laughs> I don't know how you do the so much Asia travel. I w did one trip to Asia much, and I'm I was knocked out for two days when I got there. It was like... No, uh, one of my favorite flights used to be New York, Hong Kong. But when Ooh. you arrive in Hong Kong, you're dead. That's that was me, yeah. yeah. Fifteen and a half hours. Yeah, it's it's tough. <sighs> yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I'm dead. <laughs> All right. All right, Pepe, Thank you so okay, much. Okay, guys. Thanks, Thanks so very much. much. Take care. Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. And that's our show. I want to thank you for listening, and a special thank you to Pepe Escobar for doing the interview with us. You can follow Pepe's work on Facebook and find his work at Asia Times. That's atimes.com. If you'd like to support the show, we deeply appreciate it. You can go to patreon.com slash around the empire for as little as $5 a month. Helps us put the show on. Also, check out our website, aroundtheempire.com. Questions, comments, want to yell at me, dan at aroundtheempire.com and follow us on Twitter at Around the Empire. See you next time. Take care, everyone.